Good afternoon, everybody and YouTube world that's interested in listening to a video on Christian marriage, Christian sexuality. I uh, would like to put a disclaimer on this to begin with, please. Uh, it's not, it would not be offensive or wrong to have your teenagers listen in, but just for sake of clarity and simplicity at this point in time, it might be better if this is just for adults, particularly married adults or those who have been married or who are planning on becoming married um, <clears throat> because this is a subject I'll be addressing. Hi, hey, you wonder why would Linda Courtney be qualified to talk about a marriage call or a subject called marriage? Well, probably because I've had a couple failed marriages. And many times in life we learn by our mistakes. We have le we learned also by our human experience. We're not perfect. Even you married people that have been married for 30 years, you might claim to be you know, you might claim to have achieved the top of the mountain. But truth be told, you still have your struggles, you still have some besetting sins, you're not uh, perfect, you have not achieved that place in life. So we all learn as we go. And I would like to do this video in honor of the people that need to hear this message. Marriage, as you know, is a covenant and when we enter into a covenant it behooves us to get to know the parties involved we already believe we know ourselves at least we hope we know ourselves fairly well but again really in many cases we don't and I'll explain that in just a minute it also is good that we have taken time to get to know the person we plan to marry. In my case, the, child, the, the father of my four children and myself, we dated for, I believe it was nine months, which is a considerable period of time. But he hid something from me very well that was fully exposed on our wedding night. And it affected our entire marriage of 14 years. I am not going to get graphic at this point in time, but later on, either in this video or in another, I will tell you because you need to know this is a very, unfortunately, common practice in even in marriages today, and it can destroy them completely. Uh, the similar situation in my other uh, try at marriage, but a different scenario. Something that was hidden called adultery. I had no idea until several months, actually that took months, and I discovered a letter that was written to my husband by his lover. Nevertheless, I tried to make the marriage work, and I stuck it out for six years. I didn't walk out the first day I knew something was going on. Uh, biblically speaking, I had every right to leave both of these marriages because they neither one involved a man that was truly faithful to me. And I would like to say there are two things that will destroy a marriage faster than other problems. The first one is sex. The second one is money. And if a couple, if they're having trouble in both of these areas at the same time, their marriage is in a world of hurt. Hopefully, it's just one or the other. <clears throat> Why would sex be that important? I mean, why, why shouldn't it be <clears throat> that if a couple is just having a bad 
bad sex life, why shouldn't they stick it out? Because after all, you've heard a hundred times that, quote, oh, there's more to marriage than sex. Well, yes, there is. But marriage, let's go back to the beginning. Marriage is a covenant, a sacred covenant before God that is sealed by the, by the hopefully by the love of two people. And that covenant involves sex. And when you become married and you sign on that dotted line on your marriage license and certificate, to be married until death do you part. That means you have made a covenant to provide sex to your mate when they so need it and desire it. Now, there are times, of course, sickness, separation, if you're on a trip, whatever, that it can't happen. But generally speaking, there is no excuse as long as you're able to withhold. In fact, the Bible makes that very clear. I'd like to just base this on the Word of God. And you know these scriptures very well. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, fornication is not just sex between unmarried people. Fornication involves a lot more and I'll make a video on that word one of these days, but nevertheless. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due belevenance, belevenance, <laughs> sexual favors, in other words, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife has not power over her own body, but the husband. And likewise, also the husband has not power over his body, but the wife. Defraud. Now get that word in your mind, defraud. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, and that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. It says in the word of God, defraud not one another except it be for consent, with consent for a time. I look that word up in the Strong's, the word uh, defraud. It means to despoil, and it means to keep back by fraud. So there you go. Marriage is a covenant. In that covenant, you have agreed to provide sex for your mate, unless there are extenuating circumstances. When you defraud your mate, without a good reason or if if there's consent there's that's another story that we just read but other than that if you defraud your mate you have actually broken your covenant of marriage you have kept back by fraud and that's the bible speaking now there's another scripture that alludes to uh, sex in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, you're familiar with this one. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now I want you to get that first part. This applies to married people. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. I, you know, if there were something that God did not want a married couple to do in the marriage bed, he had a perfect place right here to include that. To say, but 
Thus saith the Lord, you know, this is bad and that is bad and this is sinful and that is sinful. But there is no mention. Marriage is honorable and all and the bed is undefiled. You know, years and years and years ago, I uh, was in a big building and they had several uh, venues of um, uh, things going on. And behind these big open doors, there was a seventh day Adventist uh, meeting and um, I happened to be walking by with my husband at the time and I and they had a, a microphone on and it was very loud and I overheard the minister talking to the people I assume it was a minister and I went like wait just a minute and I said to my husband I said stop I want to hear what they're saying so we stood back kind of on the side of the door where nobody could see us and the speaker was telling the, the people at this uh, conference, I would assume it was, all the things that were wrong and sinful pertaining to the marriage bed. And he was going on and on about how God would frown on this and this is a sin and this shouldn't be done and that. And I'm listening to this and I'm going like, wow, you have left nothing there for them to do and also, I had read a book um, on, I was on marriage, it wasn't just on sex, but there was a section on uh, sex, and in that section, the minister, and it was written by an ordained minister of many, many years, he was an older man, he said that according to the uh, plan of God, there is only one way in marriage to have sex, and that's the missionary position. You know what that is. And I was in that organization when I read the book. And I'm thinking, wow, that really narrows it down. And that's pretty much what the Seventh-day Adventist group was also hearing from their teacher. So, to me, it really threw a bit of a wet blanket because, you know, um, when God said the marriage bed is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, that leaves room for enjoyment, for having fun, for learning what is pleasurable to your mate. And people don't defraud your mate. Sex, if not properly understood and provided to your mate in the proper way, in time, will damage and even ruin and destroy your marriage. Linda Courtney how can you talk? You've been divorced. Yes. May I share a story with you? I don't do this to soil the memory of my first husband. I loved him deeply and dearly. I probably still do. He is the father to our four wonderful great children. I mean, my we have great kids. But let me... Let me just share with you a little story about what was hidden from me until after I said I do. We stood in the Catholic Church. I was a little Catholic girl on my 18th birthday. He was 20 years old and had to get uh, written permission from his parents to marry me. He was in the Air Force. His hometown was in Nebraska. Mine was in a little town in Washington. We stood before the priest in the Catholic Church and he pledged his love to me and me to him. <clears throat> that night we traveled out of town. I wore a beautiful red dress that my mother had so carefully sewn for me. I was looking forward to going out to dinner with my new husband and coming back to the motel 
and making love. We got to the motel. He threw me back on the bed, consummating a marriage. He got up, went out, bought hamburgers, and that was our wedding supper. We each ate a hamburger in the motel room. What the man had hidden from me <clears throat> was that he actually preferred <clears throat> he actually preferred to take care of himself in that way. I don't want to be graphic. Occasionally, we would make love, if you could call it that. But the majority of the time, he would deny me. He would just plain tell me he wasn't in the mood or wasn't interested, didn't want to. And then he'd go someplace and satisfy himself. And as I said, my other husband had a lover on the side. So I think I am not disqualified from talking to you about this subject. You know, there's um, the other issue is money. If you don't see eye to eye with money, that can be a big stumbling block. That's why, again, it's important to get to know the person before you say, I do. Try very hard to make sure there's nothing hidden because eventually it will show up. And if you don't see eye to eye on money or on anything else in marriage, communication is the very, very most important thing. If you don't know how to talk to each other and with each other, you cannot have a good marriage. To a woman, she needs security. To a man, he needs his ego built up. It's up to the woman to see to it that she applauds her husband, is proud of him, gives him some praise, emotional support, honey, that's a good job. I appreciate what you're doing to earn, you know, a living to bring in uh, what we need here as a couple or as a family. You know, you do, you do really good. And then the woman needs security. He need, she needs the man to make her feel safe and loved and wanted and cared for and honored. Well, men and women both need to be honored. You know, the old-fashioned marriage vows are still the best. Except for, how about that part about women to obey your husbands? Well, somebody has to have the final say. And uh, I think that it should be the man, unless he's made a decision that could cause harm. And then the woman has a right to preempt that if it's a damaging decision, but if it's not damaging or hurtful, then the man should make the final decision. I basically am quite old-fashioned in that way, and uh, that's my advice on that. I'd like to get back really quick to something in the Bible on the, uh, the intimate part of marriage. To people that say, oh, um, all these extra things in, in the marriage bed, they're sinful and they're wrong. I mean, I have some people that believe that French kissing or deep kissing is a sin. Well, I'd like to just quote this from the Word of God in the Song of Solomon, which a lot of people won't even read because they think it's a, a dirty book. Shame on them. It's the Word of God. Chapter 4, verse, uh, five, verse 5, 9, 
10 and 11. Your, your two breasts are like two young rows that are twins which feed among the lilies. Until the day break and the shadows flee away, I will get me to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of frankincense. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. He's telling his beloved, his wife, there's nothing in you I see any imperfection in, any spot in. You're altogether fair. The marriage bed is undefiled and honorable in all. Goes on to say, How fair is your love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is your love than wine and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. Thy lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. Now how would he know that? Because he's French deep kissing her. That's how. It goes on in the next chapter, chapter 5. In verse 16, she responds to him. His mouth, not lips, but mouth. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. So the wife there is describing also deep kissing. I've had people say, no, that's wrong. It just has to be lip to lip. No, it doesn't. The Word of God explains quite well God's desire for a married couple. Um, I'd like to add one point here. In another video, I'm, I intend to get more a little bit more detailed on this subject that pertains to people of all ages, even teenagers. But I'd like to say this, that when you're married and you have the, your spouse with you, there is no excuse for going off by yourself and taking care of your sexual needs. You know what I mean. You have made a covenant before God to give this pleasure to your married, beloved person, the one you're married to. That's your promise and your covenant. And if you break it, you're spoiling them, you're defrauding them, and you're hurting your marriage. Uh, the human anatomy was designed by our Creator. And when you think about it, Jesus Christ himself designed our human anatomy. In my next video, I plan to tell you a little bit about the female anatomy. There's something that all females have, and... Uh, Few females really know about it or know what the function is. I'm not an expert. I don't have a degree. I'm not a psychologist, a psychiatrist. I'm not a doctor of sexuality. But I've lived a long time. I've learned a lot. I've been through a lot. I've read a lot. And I want to share a lot. Because... There's just a lot to learn. And the more we know, the better it will be for us. Because ignorance is not bliss. To be ignorant is just plain stupid. 
<laughs> There's so much we have yet to learn that can make our lives and our marriages so much better. Well, I'm going to end this one for now. Um, bottom line, I'll leave you with this thought again. Communication, communication, communication. Talk, talk, talk with your mate. If for any reason um, you're considering separation or divorce, unless you've really hit rock bottom, try communicating again. Try it. Remember, the man needs his ego built up. The woman needs security built up. And when you can do those two at the same time, you're going to bring a couple closer together. But sometimes it takes a lot of honest, right here, gut level, right from your gut, gut level, talking it out. And if you have any love left for each other, do not be afraid of being honest. God told me one day in a church service, without honesty, there can be no real healing. And that means in all areas of life. We need to be honest. You know, think about it. If you go to a doctor and uh, you think you might have appendicitis and it hurts in the right side of your lower abdomen, but you go in there and you say, oh, I have a sore throat, and then next day your appendix bursts and you die of peritonitis, that's your own fault because you weren't being honest. And yes, I'm being melodramatic. You know I am. But you know you get the point. The same thing in a marriage. Address the problem. Be honest about what's going on. And if you're afraid of each other, that's also a big thing. That was uh, kind of the way I felt. I was so intimidated and afraid of uh, bringing the subjects up that the, the uh, poison in the marriage and the actions that were going on in my marriage just continued to rot it until there was nothing left. So, I don't know what to tell you if you're afraid of your maid. That's uh, a big strike against you. But still, at least try communication. Try talking. Okay, I'm going to let this go for now. I'm going to just say a little prayer, and uh, we'll sign off. And remember, I am going to try to come back with something that's a little more in depth that I think I think you'll like to hear. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, just praise you and thank you, Lord. I I'm nobody special. I still have a lot to learn myself, but what you've shown me, what I've gone through, I pray that you will help the people to understand that uh, sometimes life gets really graphic. And we have to address issues that we would rather not address, but we must. And I ask that you come alongside each and every man and woman that's watched this video. And if there's a problem in their marriage, bless them, guide them, help them, and help them to communicate with the person they love so they can achieve a breakthrough and hold their marriage together. And I pray in Jesus' holy name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, that's all for now. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I send my love. Bye-bye.